هو ابو ان تندن Buenas tardes, buenas tardes a todos. Gracias por venir a, a este seminario, eh, a este seminario organizado por el grupo Interasia, que hoy tenemos un, un día dedicado a la poesía, a la poesía china. Y eh, esta, hemos tenido esta mañana a la poeta Pan Wuyi, que ha hecho una presentación de su obra. Y esta tarde vamos a... Contamos, es un honor eh, eh, tener como invitado. Eh, it is a pleasure eh, to, to have a professor and poet and translator, Brian Holton. Eh, Brian Holton is one expert in Chinese poetry. Eh, one of the last work he has collaborated in uh, anthology, anthology of uh, Chinese poetry, uh, Jade Ladder. Jade Ladder about Chinese modern poetry. You know? uh, uh, he, he has collaborated. It's not the first time that you are here in mm. Barcelona, and we we hope that it will it, it will be not also the last time. And we would like to invite you again as Pan Wuyi poet no? to, 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 to know more of your works. Mm. Today, uh, Brian Holton, with a long experience in China and as one of the main experts in Chinese poetry, is going to speak about one very important poet. It's one way. One way, and especially about the Chinese Buddhist imaginary and the Bakun. No? Mm -hmm. uh, I think it will be very, very interesting. Uh, thank you. Welcome, Barcelona, again. Thank you very much for being here with us. And please. Thank you, thank you very much. It's a pleasure to be here. Like I said earlier on, 20 años antes he hablado. Español, pero he olvidado mucho. No parlo catalán. So it'll have to be English, I'm afraid. Je uh, vois pudon. Je vois pudon. Okay, go, je vois. Okay, I just asked who can speak Chinese. Can you speak Chinese? No, good, excellent. So that's fine. I, I like to ask these questions so I know what needs to be explained and what doesn't need to be explained. This is one of the most difficult things for a translator, knowing what you need to explain, especially if you're translating from mother tongue. If you're a Chinese translator, translating Chinese literature into English, then you cannot assume your English reader knows the same things as you do. I am uh, married to the Chinese writer, the Beijing writer, Guo Ying, and when we first met, she kept saying, I, I, she'd tell me things, and I'd, as husband said to wives, I'd say, how do you know this? She said, everybody knows this. Her set of everybody knows is not the same as my set of everybody knows. This is what translators do. If it wasn't the case, then machines would do, the software would do the job. Okay? So what I want to talk to you about is, a, is a, te a Chinese text. And if you don't speak Chinese and, or read Chinese, it may not be obvious from the beginning what kind of text it is. But I, for those of you who don't speak Chinese, I want to show you how you can explore a text. For those of you who do speak Chinese, you will, you will think that you know this poem. But I can almost guarantee that um, I can show you things you hadn't thought about in it. So for translators, this is an exercise in reading. It's often forgotten. This is our primary skill as translators. We can't write unless we first read. And we all think that because we've graduated from high school, we can read. But reading, like any other skill, is open-ended. You can get better and better and better at it. And that's one thing that in translation of Chinese literature into Western languages is not, not enough attention is paid to the translator's reading skills. 
Nor is enough attention paid to the other thing, the main thing I want to focus on here is the translator's writing skills. If you translate a joke from one language to another, the joke is funny in the first language but not funny in your translation. Is that a good translation? If you take a poem which is beautiful, elegant and moving in language one and your translation is boring and dull, you haven't finished your job. Just like the unfunny joke, it's not working. Right? Now, if you, if you enjoy reading translation theory, there are many long books and written about this sort of thing. I have no time for translation theory. I think it is no help to the practicing translator. I once heard the great Chinese-English translator, Professor John Minford, say that he said that when he is stuck with a problem of translation, he never reaches for a book of theory because it doesn't help. Okay, so this is where I'm coming from. How do translators work? How do we make a text that does what it's supposed to? So one of the things that when Buddhism went to China 2,000 years ago and encountered the native tradition, the Taoist tradition we heard of from Pan Wu Yi, one of the things that came out of that is what's known in the West as Zen Buddhism. Zen is the Japanese reading of Chan, Chinese character Chan Zong, shares with Taoism a profound distrust of language. Zhi zhi bu yan, yan zhi bu zhi. An ancient text far older than Buddhism. And people who speak don't know. People who know don't speak. I'm not sure what that means, to be honest. But there is a distrust of language. And the basic Buddhist thing, I'll be finished this preface very soon. The basic Buddhist idea is that the sense of self is an illusion. There is no separate self. It's a seamless garment. There's no I and you. There's no subject and object. Nor is there a continuing self. So there's a silence at the heart of Buddhism where we would expect to find the human personality. So the challenge of Buddhism is to explore the human heart and find out how we can integrate it with this. The Buddha Gautama's first great insight that we have only our sense perceptions. We know nothing of the world except what our senses tell us. And we cannot, as you know, rely on our senses. So, here is a poem in which everything important is unsaid. It's silent. Can you translate it? How do you translate silence? Those of you who don't read Chinese, what are you seeing? What do you see on the screen? <laughs> Those you, you can't see their faces. They're going, mm -hmm. <laughs> the answer is it's just, you know, it could, it could be the marks of a, of a chicken running across the page, couldn't it? It has no meaning, there's no content. And if you're translating out of mother tongue, this is a very important lesson to learn. The things that you think, your set of what everybody knows is not widely shared. As widely shared. However, if we do this, what are you seeing now? What do you see? Go on, take a guess. There's punctuation. Right. What does it look like? Well, I know, I know you know, but yes. Yeah, see? Regular line length, four, four symbols in each line, followed by a comma, another four followed by a full stop. Looks like a poem. Right. Now, you see, those of you who speak Chinese, you see what your audience doesn't know. Simple, basic things. And I suppose if you look at it, you can see certain repetitions in it. Are these a significant pattern or not? Now that's what we don't know. Here we then move towards, there is something being printed up for you which covers all of this. Um, this gives you the um, a sort of dictionary word for word literal for each word there. So we can now see that this poem is by Wang Wei who was living in China in the 8th century, sorry, 7th to 8th century, 699 to 759. He was an aristocrat. He was related to the royal family. And he was hugely rich. Now, Chinese people, what else do we know about Wang Wei? What do you know about Wang Wei? I didn't know much about Wang Wei. <sighs> 
Oh, young people nowadays don't read books. <laughs> you know more than non-Chinese readers, though. So what little thing? Tell me one thing about Wang Wei. He's a Buddhist poet, yes. You see, you didn't know that, did you? So, you know, translators are needed not just because of words, right? because of silences. Silences in what we know as well as silences in what we say. So, empty hill, not sea person. This is not English. But if you don't speak Chinese, you need to be told that, for instance, deer park, is deer singular or plural? Is park singular or plural? Chinese nouns are not marked for number. The Chinese verb is not marked for tense. There are almost no verb endings, and certainly in poetry, verb endings are almost unheard of. There are no noun endings. There's no conjugation, no declension, no articles. There is the habit, especially in poetry, of leaving out objects and subjects, especially pronoun subjects, pronoun objects. It's one of these things is for speakers of European languages which insist on number, tense, gender, Chinese doesn't have gender, we have to supply these as translators. Because as what you see here is not a poem, empty hill, not sea person. Is it one person or many? Is it one hill or many? Chinese can exist in a state of eternity with its, its, its verbs unmarked. And what is often actually quite often a very simple statement about something very practical is often rendered by translators into European languages into some great mystical statement about the meaning of life when it's actually just saying, oh look, there's the bus stop. Or, you know, something as simple as that because of this. So, we know that he was a, a Buddhist poet. He was also a painter and it's famously said of him that his poems are paintings and his paintings are poems. So we see we open with the empty mountains nobody there a sense of absence but we are in the mountains so we can prepare ourselves to, re to read a poem that's about landscape but there are only a couple of references to that deer park is not a normal english collocation when you put two words together and you get something magical if it means anything, it refers to the Middle Ages in England, the Kingdom of England and the Kingdom of Scotland, when kings would set aside a piece of land for hunting in. So a deer park would be for hunting. Now, Wang Wei was a Buddhist. Do Buddhists go hunting? Tell me, would Buddhists eat animals? No, he was a, he'd be a vegetarian. So this, immediately putting these two words together, you're giving a wrong impression. So I'm going to go back and look at that. So, not see person, but, and this is rare in Chinese poetry to have a, con uh, a conjunction like but. But, here, word, and uh, this, the word you can be either word or voice. It means both, sound. Right? Return, and then this next word, ying, jing, it's both. In this period, nowadays we read it as jing, and it means light. But it can also be, in this period, it can be what we now, we now write it differently, dianing, the, the, the shadow that's used in the word for cinema. So here we have a word that could be light or shadow. Isn't that wonderful? What a gift to poets. A one word that means two opposing things. There is... Students of Chinese are told, and it is true, in one of the very old and rather obscure dictionaries, there is a, an adjective which can be, mean either black or white, depending. I found it when I was an under, undergraduate. I can't remember it now, but it does exist. So any language has these terms of great openness. They can mean whatever you want them to mean. So here we have light and shade together in, in the forest, which is the second geographical indication. Right? We're in a mountain, we've got a mountain and a forest. And then again, shine, green, moss on. Chinese doesn't have prepositions, it has postpositions. So instead of saying on green moss, it says green moss on. This is not a translation. Now we start looking at this word again, this poem again. Let's pass on the title just now. That requires background knowledge. 
And as translators, when you're approaching a poem, one of the first things you have to do is find out what you don't know. Kung, Zhong Wen na, Kung Shang Mei Sa, Kung Ji Shu Sa, Sa Ji Shu Kung, Kung Bu Yi Yi Sa, Sa Bu Yi Yu Kung. What does that Kung mean? You're laughing. Tell me what Kung means. Empty or... Uh, sorry, that's the wrong answer. If a translator asks what does it mean, you should answer, it depends. Because it always does depend. Yes, it's a technical term in Buddhism. It means empty. But it's also the key term in several schools of Buddhism, including Zen, or Chan in China, which translates the Sanskrit word sunyata. This is the void, the emptiness, the unreality of, for instance, our sense of the separate self. Uh, the unreality of objects. We know nothing of the object. We only know what our senses tell us. We don't know the reality. That perception is void, empty. So the very first word that we look at here is a key term in Buddhist thought. And it's the lens through which we view the whole poem. So the, the mountains are empty in the sense that there's nobody there. That's what it tells us. But what does the poem mean? As translators, we must, ah oh yes, um, as translators, we must deal with what the poem says and what it means. And these are often two different things. What's being handed out is a piece of paper which contains stuff for your reference. Thank you. See what happens if you give students a piece of paper? Don't read it now. It's for you to take away and think about later. And when I start looking at other people's translations, it will be useful for you to, although it be up here, you might want to make notes. So, here we have the, thank you, the void, the emptiness that's at the heart of all things in Buddhist thinking, and there is no person there. The verbs are neither active nor passive. That's something else we have to be done. Only the sound of human voices is coming from somewhere. Before I continue with that, another thing we need to know is if we listen to the sound of this. Now, I cannot read this the way that the poet himself would have pronounced it. The Chinese writing system doesn't give you sounds very easily. Imagine a telephone number, which you can read in Chinese, Catalan, English. Right? The marks you make on the page give you the, sound, the idea, but not the sound. So how he read it, we don't really know. We can conjecture, we can guess, but the shape of the tones, we will never know. So in modern Chinese, which is a convention that we do, Kong Shan, Bu Jian Ren, Dan Wen Ren Yu Xiang, Fan Ying Ru Shen Lin, Fu Zhao Qing Tai Shang. Notice, Xiang, Shang, where you see the full stops, we have a rhyme. Chinese poems rhyme. We also have a rhythm. One, two, one, two, three. Now, there's no, where there are no labeling, grammatical labeling, this, this rhythm is extremely important. Kung Shan, Bu Jian Ren. So that pause tells us that the, the subject of Jian, of sea, is not the mountain. We're not saying the mountain doesn't see people. The rhythm tells us that. Okay? Now, so we have the statement. Chinese poems have a structure. It's almost like a sonata form, like a musical structure. You have your opening statement. And then the second line in this case is the development. Qi, the opening statement. Cheng, the development, which expands on that. The third state, dran, the turn, or the modulation in, in musical terms, like a key change. And then he, the resolution. And this structure is a beautiful example of that. Out on the hills, we don't see anybody, but we hear voices in the distance. The light is returning into the forest. Okay, we're going, we're brought into the forest. What time of day is this poem happening? Tell me, speak to me. What time of day is this poem happening? The poet is telling us, thank you. It could be early morning, it could be evening. Why do you say that? Because of the light crossing the, the trees. Yes, yes. 
You can imagine the deep forest. When the sun is high, you don't see it. It's only when it rises and sets when the light is low. Now, since he says returning light or returning shadow, it's more likely to be the afternoon. And it shines on the moss. There is nothing there. It's a beautiful little picture. It was probably, we're not too sure, probably written to accompany a painting. He, there was a, a, a painting of his estates. He called it his country cottage, but it was a vast estate near Xi'an. You know these Chinese scrolls, which work like sort of, they're like mechanical movies. You know, you open it up and look at the first bit, and then you roll that closed and look at the next bit. So you pan across the scene. So part of his estate was called uh, Lu Dai, Deer Park. Now, that's what the poem says. The question now before us is, what does this poem mean? And that's a much more tricky business. We can read as closely as we like into it. There's an interesting repetition, lines three and four, return and again. They both express the idea of something is happening not for the first time. They tell us that it's an afternoon thing. Um, now, let me say a word about the best, oh, this very first Kung empty hill. Sunyata, the Sanskrit term, which refers to the non-existence of the self here. Wang Wei studied this kind of Buddhism for 10 years. It was sometimes known as pure land Buddhism, but it's in China this is always mixed up with pure land. The pure land is related to the Buddha Amitabha, is his Sanskrit name, Amitofo. And where does Amitofo live? You're the expert, Pan Wui. Where does Amitofo, where does Am Amitofo? You want? Yes, but where does he live? Yeah. Okay, fine. All right. Okay, so we'll think about the Jingtu, the pure land, which is in the west. It's not stated in the poem. But where is the sun coming from? And where does it go? So what we have here is a picture of a little movie of a process. And, you know, the idea of this, this meditation, you know, meditating on the name of uh, Amitabha Buddha, is a way of uh, coming to terms and internalizing the pure land. And in a sense, in, there's a sense in which um, you can, if you internalize the concept of the pure land and it, it is in your heart, then you will live in the pure land. You will make paradise. You will clean your perceptions and, and live in a better place. Now, what I want to do now is look at, very quickly, at three other translations of this poem and see how they approach you have now seen what these poets saw when they began translating. Um, Gary Snyder is a very well-known poet, Californian poet, a poet of the wilderness, a beat poet. Um, he chooses not to translate the title, Other Voices. So he takes an image here. Now, Ezra Pound wrote that you should not translate the words, you translate the image. Allow the text to make a movie in your head and then write that movie down. Use the images. It's very much what Snyder is doing here. And notice his structure, empty mountains, no one to be seen. Remember the Chinese? Kung Shan Bu Jian Ren, one, two, one, two, three. He splits the line to emphasize that, and he does have two stresses, empty mountains. Three stresses, no one to be seen. Well, in American English it would. Scottish English, it doesn't quite work. But. <laughs> Right. Yet, here, human sounds and echoes. Sounds and echoes is a very literal way of interpreting the Chinese, but it gives them his three beats, human, sounds, and echoes. Poets do these things, you know. They will, if you focus on form, you lose a little content. If you want content, you lose form. If you, want to, if you want everything of what is said by the poem, then you will lose its rhymes and its rhythms. You can't get both. So, and he has this yet done here when he makes it into an imperative, which is a very neat way of avoiding the pronoun problem. English 
insists much more than Spanish on pronouns, pronoun subjects, pronoun objects. Chinese dispenses with them, which gives us a big problem. So many Chinese translations of Chinese poetry in, into English use gerunds and gerundives, rather than say he hears or he heard, which would be to imply tense and number and gender, people will say hearing to avoid these issues. So the imperative avoids that. Empty mountains, no one to be seen, yet hear human sounds and echoes. Returning sunlight enters the dark woods, again shining on the green moss above. Beautifully structured and balanced, nice poem, except when I came to the very last word, I went, wait a minute, Tai is moss. Moss, you know, grows on stones, fallen trees. How can it be above? Is he looking from the bottom of the mountain up at the sort of unlikely, because if he was, then the setting sun it's not that's wrong for the setting sun. Um, is he thinking about have you ever been to Florida? You know, in the forests of the Everglades in Florida there's the Spanish moss which hangs from the trees, which you don't get in China, by the way. Is he naturalizing this poem in Venuti's sense, domesticating it, taking it out of its Chinese context and making it a Californian poem? The answer to all of these is possibly, you decide. I just want to draw your attention to some things, but this is this, in terms of the sound structure. And that is, I think, the older I get, the more I do this, the more I think this is a fundamental thing that as translators of Chinese poetry we have neglected is the sound structure of the poem. Right. For instance, we have the, the um, you know, we have the rhythm here. We have the uh, one, two, one, two, three, which is working. He doesn't rhyme. But then 1978 American poetry, rhyme was very rare. Rhyme was sort of really late 20th century, early 20, 21st. Rhyme in English was only used for comic verse. It's only in the early 21st century it made a return. So not, not having rhyme is okay, but on the other hand, look at the sounds he makes. Look at echoes above, moss, that O sound, no one. It begins with no one, echoes. And we have mountain sound. Right? There, just because there's a rhyme doesn't mean there is not a pattern. And the pattern is what makes a poem. You cannot make a poem by stringing together words from a dictionary. You cannot make a poem by explaining what is in the poem. You should not make a poem by writing what you think the author should have written. You, can't, can't make a, you shouldn't make a poem by explaining to the reader what you would have written if you'd been in this situation. The technical demands on translation, translators are very tight. We have to work on very narrow margins. But we have to make something that dances and sings. And the heart of that is sound, the heartbeat, the rhythm, and the colors of sounds, the oohs and the ahs and the ohs, are very carefully put together here. I just want to look at the vowels in this one. This next one is Burton Watson, who is one of the great translators from Chinese and Japanese. I have a great deal of respect for his work. He's known not so much as a poet, but as a translator of prose, more than but also poetry, especially when he's a young man, 1971. Now, dear fence, not dear park. Well, actually, yes, this word jai, in the quote marks at the top in blue, can mean a, f a fence, a wooden boundary fence. It can also, if you read it differently, mean firewood and, you know, it has many meanings. So deer fence is very literal, but what does a deer fence mean in English? And the problem is it doesn't mean anything. It is not a fixed collocation. It's, you put these two words together and nothing magical happens. They're just two words put together. The, the bind, the, you know, the, the two part, um, it's, not a, it's not a bisyllabic word is what I'm trying to say. However, listen to how he does it. Empty hills, no one in sight, only the sound of someone talking. Someone. Right? Snyder sounds and echoes. Snyder is impersonal. 
Burton Watson introduces a someone. There are issues here. Late sunlight enters the deep woods. He's helping us. He's telling us it's afternoon. Shining over the green moss again. So again we have a one, two, empty hills, no one in sight, one, two, one, two, three rhythm. No rhyme, but structures, quite a lot of S's in here. Sound, sorry, sight, sound, someone, sunlight, moss, and shining. That's a cohesive device that holds the thing together as it makes it a poem and not a random collection of words. So, yes, I have, a, I have an issue with Watson. Um, I think this is a very good statement of what Wang Wei said. If you want a technical term, I'm talking about denotation and connotation. The Chinese word mian bao denotes bread. That's all it does. Pu tao jiu denotes wine made from grapes. Neither have connotation. If you talk about bread and wine in English, then immediately there's the Christian connection. What the words say and what the words mean are different or can be. That's the area where translators swim. We, we swim in that water between what's meant and what's said. And Watson focuses on what's said. But does he get the Buddhist sense across? That's the issue. Because the English word empty doesn't mean the same as the Chinese kung kung ji sa sa. You know, the whole Buddhist, as a Buddhist technical term, empty doesn't do it. Empty just means empty. You see? So... There's a sense in which there is nothing in this poem. It runs through your fingers. It's the silences that make it work. And I'll come back to that in a second. So there's Watson. We now have a clear idea of what the poem says. Kenneth Rexroth, another of the great American poets. It's a, it's a coincidence that these, um, to some extent, that these three poems are all from the 1970s. But then it isn't because this little book by Octavio Paz, the great Mexican poet who, who was a very convincing reader of Chinese and a, and a convincing translator, and the Boston critic Elliot Weinberger produced this book in 1987. 19 ways of looking at 19 versions of this poem. One in French, one in Spanish, the rest in English. Their idea is, if you don't speak Chinese, they tell you how the poem works and what all the bits are. If you read 19 different versions of a poem, of a trans 19 different translations of a poem in a language you don't speak, have you read the poem? It's an interesting question, isn't it? Where does the poetry live? 2,000 years ago, the editors of the first great poetry anthology in China, Shu Jing, the Mao brothers wrote, Yi Zai Yan Wai. Meaning lies beyond the words. And it's true, it's supra-segmental. You can pronounce every word in your foreign language correctly, but if you get the sentence shape wrong, people will go, excuse me? You'll miss it. So where does the meaning lie that you're trying to transfer as a translator? This is why a dictionary definition can never be a translation, because meaning does not inhere in it. Meaning lies somewhere else. So another poet is trying to make meaning out of this. Rexroth, like Snyder, studied, studied in Japan. They're both Buddhist poets. They both have good grasp, a good grasp of Chinese and Japanese. So, you know, these guys know their business. And he translates it deep in the mountain wilderness. No connection with Wang Wei's title. Deep in the mountain wilderness where nobody ever comes. Only once in a great while, something like the sound of a far-off voice. The low rays of the sun slip through the dark forest and gleam again on the shadowy moss. Now, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven lines. We saw four lines in the Chinese, eight lines in Snyder. Something, what's happened to the other line? Deep in the mountain wilderness, uh, that's not exactly what the Chinese says. We have the empty mountains where nobody ever comes, ever, that's, that adverb is not in the Chinese. Only once in a great while, excuse me, no, the Chinese doesn't say that. The Chinese says only, or but, dan. Something like, 
I'm sorry, what is like a sound? Is it a sound or not a sound? Is there something like a sound? You could understand if he was saying something like a voice, because the bark of a deer, the bleat of a sheep sometimes can be like a human voice. But he says something like the sound. Something else is happening here. Rexroth is, is less, far less engaged with what Wang Wei says. He's trying to engage with what Wang Wei means. Now you can call that paraphrase if you like. I don't much care. Rexroth is taking the raw material of the Wang Wei poem and making an American poem. This poem quite clearly, rather like Snyder, this poem happens in America. Mountain wilderness. That's not a term that Chinese would be comfortable in Chinese, that collocation. But we have the same image. We have the silence, the far off voice, the sun shining on the moss. And I think this is the point where we have to start engaging and try, try to decide for ourselves what we think this poem means. And this is where the, the background knowledge comes in knowing that the, the very first word, kung, void, emptiness, is a technical term in Buddhism. Now, it has been said that of the Chinese classics, for instance, the works of Confucius, that if you only read the first sentence or the first paragraph, you get the whole idea. They're designed so that that beginning is a lens through which you read the whole book. And if you're in a hurry, or too stupid, or whatever, even if you only read the beginning, so that in terms of the Confucian analects, to learn and constantly put your, what you learn into practice, is that not a delight? Now, what a wonderful opening line. As translators, if we don't learn, then we're dead in the water. Every new text is a new set of challenges. We can, nothing prepares us when you're translating poetry. Nothing prepares us. There is no software that can translate poetry. And you can use the, the translation management software, Trados Translation Manager, and so on. But you can't use it for poetry. Because what a word might mean depends. But what it might mean in one poem is, may have very little relationship with what it meant before. So you're on your own here. It requires deep reading and deep thinking and going away. And the French historian Marcel Bloch said, when a historian comes on an incident he doesn't understand, or a joke that doesn't seem funny to him, he said, that is when, like a hunting dog, he smells blood. Because if you're a historian and there's something you don't understand, then clearly that's what you should be exploring. You should be looking at that. And similarly with translators. If we look at something and you say, I don't know why that word is there, that is the beginning of the process. Every first draft is, you know, is a set of questions. Can the text mean this? Can it mean that? And as you come towards your final draft, some questions are solved, other questions come up. What can we do, having some idea now of Wang Wei's intention to write a poem about Buddhist, the experience of a Buddhist in a landscape? How do we go about getting that into a t the target language? Right, now, I'm going to take a little pause from that, not to answer questions, um, but I'd like you to ask me some questions at this point, because I know I've been, I've been saying things and so I can see some of you going, I'm mm, not sure if that's true. You want to interrupt me, ask any questions? Please do. No. Nope. Fine. Well, if at any point you disagree or you'd like to question something I say, then just stop me. Okay? We've got plenty of time. This is all the time in the world to get through this. And I want to stop thinking about this, to, to turn away for a moment from meaning and, and um, go back a bit to the original Chinese text, because those of you who don't speak Chinese don't know how the text is built. Yes, it has rhyme very familiar. Chinese rhymes with great facility. It's very difficult to rhyme as easily as that in English. Chinese rhymes even more easily than Italian does. You can, and it, it also, 
you can rhyme, have the same rhyme over 100, 150 lines in Chinese and it still keeps working. Somehow or other, the Chinese ear doesn't get bored with the sound. But that's not what the poem is built on. Yes, there is rhythm, one, two, one, two, three. The seven-syllable line, which is also classical, is one, two, three, four, one, two, three. But that's not what the poem is built on. It's built instead on pitch. I'm just going to explain that. Classical Latin poetry, Greek poetry, Sanskrit poetry is based on length, long vowels and short vowels. Andramo ennepe musa. Right? Some vowels are by their nature either long or short. Chinese doesn't have that. What Chinese has is pitch. Now, in modern standard Chinese, in Cantonese, there are four pitch shapes. There's level, a, ah, rising, a, ah, dipping, a, ah, and falling, a. Ah. Ma, 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 ma. These are quite distinct to the Chinese. These are four words. There are more tonal languages in the world than non-tonal. Europe is the odd man out. Many of the la native languages of the Americas are tonal. Many of the African languages are tonal. Yoruba, for instance, in Nigeria, has a tone. It works like Shanghai, like Shanghai dialect. Very complex sentence tone pattern. And it's also got lots and lots of inflections and endings. It's a fiercely complex language. In Europe, we're peculiar. We don't have tonal languages. And it's the tone that structures it. So the tones in classical times were divided into two parts level and not level. So your line has to be level, level, oblique, oblique, level. Right? So plus, plus, minus, minus, plus. And that means the next line has to be a mirror image. Minus, minus, plus, plus, minus. And you've got rhyme, and you've got rhythm, and you've got sense, and you've got grammar, and you've got everything else. This, this is poetry of tremendous precision. And to write so simply, this poem is so simple you can give it to first year undergraduates and they hardly need to look up a dictionary because the words are so simple and obvious. Right? You read that as a student, Javier? Did you read this as, as an undergraduate? It was easy, wasn't it? They read it at primary school. How well do you know it, though? So here's a poem of great, of great technical finesse, and yet great simplicity. So another level of invisibility is the, is the art in it. It's very highly skilled, closely structured, but the highest art, as they say, is not visible. It's skilled because it, makes, it, it takes an extraordinarily difficult form and makes it look easy. What does that say to us as translators? What should our text look like? Should our text be similarly skilled, similarly balanced, similarly structured, similarly display a similar high level of craftsmanship? And I, I would say yes, it must. If you're translating a poem and your text does not move the reader, then you haven't finished. And I would say the vast majority of Chinese poetry in English is in this unfinished stage. It doesn't work as a poem in English. These examples, these little poems, do work as poems, but then the question is, to what extent do they express what Wang Wei was trying to express? Some people will say this is impossible. That if you're going to make a poem, it has to be your poem, your interpretation. And as we know, there is no stable text. I translate, I'm, I've translated with this last book. I, I worked with a young, very talented young translator in Hong Kong. Now, a 25-year-old Hong Kong person has an understanding of, of Chinese which is not the same as mine. As a non-native speaker, I miss the jokes. You know, whereas my assistant, as a native speaker of Chinese, she reads the text far better than I ever will. However, she is not well enough equipped to make a, to make a poem. Her English is not good enough. Now, this is the awful warning to translators, Chinese people who want to translate poetry into English. I will only say one thing to you, don't. 
to, try, to write a poem requires more than fluency. It requires mastery. And some very small number of non-native speakers do master a language well enough to write poetry in it, but it's tiny. You're far better to work with a poet. Maybe he doesn't know Chinese, but work with a poet, and you can almost guarantee that you will produce a poem. The tricky thing philosophically is the relationship between your poem and, in this case, Wang Wei's poem. And here Rexroth is taking Wang Wei off for a little walk through America. He's turning him into an American poet. It's not bad. I'm not saying it's bad. But what exactly are we missing? If you'll forgive my accent. Now this is Octav Octav Octavio Paz. Paz, he would say. He was Mexican, right? In la ermita. What is an ermita? Del Parque de los Venados. Now, Venados is the deer, is it not? And the parque, well, that's obvious what that is. So we've got Lu Chai, deer park. But what's this malarkey? What's this ermita? We don't see that in the Chinese. So is he rewriting the poem? I love to use this poem with... Um, uh, I've used this uh, poem with classes of Chinese people who don't speak Spanish. And it's a perfect illustration for them. If you don't speak Spanish, you're not concerned with the meaning. But I want to look at the sound. Look at the vowels. No se ve gente en este monte. O, e, 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 o, e. Right? Solo se oyen lejos voces. Here it's the reverse. O, 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 with the occasional e. So that's like the original tone pattern. Ping, ping, za, za, ping. Right? Za, za, ping, ping, za. He's taking his E's and his O's, and it's a mirror image. Now, what, make, what makes poetry work? What makes a text sing? In the 1920s, the Scottish poet Hugh McDermott said, it's soon and no sense that fathoms the heart to men, which in English means it's sound and not sense that gets deep into your heart. The heartbeat of the poem. You know, in our mother's womb, we have rhythm, heartbeat, for our first consciousness. Right? And here we have a beautiful rhythm. But we have also melody. And in this case, it's the vowels, the vowel sounds. That holds this together. And then, qi trung dran he, remember? Opening statement, development. The opening statement is e eh, 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 with a couple of oh. The development is oh, 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 with a couple of eh. And then look at the third line. Por los ramajes. Ah. La luz rompe. We've got ah and ooh. A new development here. And that third line is the new development, the modulation, the key change, the new thing that happens. And then we come back. Tendida entre la hierba bria verde. Eh, 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 eh. With an e, e. Right? And a couple of ah. But basically the eh sound is coming back. Now, that is how a poem works. That's how it sings. We cannot, in European non-tonal languages, we cannot replicate exactly the meter, the, the, the tonal uh, metrics of the original. It just cannot be done. But skilled craftsmen like Paz can suggest a structure by the use of tone color. And I would suggest there are two very, very important lessons for translators. One is when you read somebody else's poetry, be very, very conscious of how it works. What are the hidden springs that make it work? The English poet W.H. Auden talked of a poem as a contraption made of words. A contraption is a sort of made-up machine that probably doesn't work very well. Right? A very shaky machine. A shaky old house is a poem. It's made up, it's a machine made of words. It's a mouthful of air. But it, it's held together by, by its colour of the, of the sounds and by its rhythms. We have not tried hard enough as translators of Chinese poetry. We have not tried hard enough. 
We have spent too much time, like Burton Watson, in trying to tell the reader what the Chinese poem says. And in consequence, what the Chinese poem means has slipped through our fingers. This is an extraordinarily difficult poem because there's almost nothing in it. Weinberger says of it, uh, it carries to an extreme the characteristics of Chinese poetry. Impersonality, remember omission of pronouns? Absence of, t uh, absence of time, absence of subject. In Wang Wei's poem, the solitude is so great that not even the poet is present. Very difficult to do that in European languages. Easier in Spanish or in French, where you have refl reflexive verbs and infinitives. You have verb forms that don't require pronoun subjects. Uh, English, that's very difficult to carry off. Now, he also, Weinberger also points out that both these, these lines in the original, the third and fourth lines, begin with this idea of return. So there's something important here, a message of the return. Now, in one sense, it's a sort of frozen recurrence, something that happens again and again and again and again. But I want now to introduce the idea of, of the metaphor really behind this poem. And it's about spiritual experience. This Buddhist idea that the illusion of the separate self, the unreliability of the sense perceptions. And I think this poem is an image of someone going out into the mountains and sitting alone in the forest and meditating. And suddenly realizing I sat down in the morning and the sun has gone to the west on one level. It's just a simple story about a man going for a walk, a little movie about a man going for the walk in the mountains, sitting down to lose himself. I would just say that meditation is a very poor English word to describe um, chan zuo. Um, the original Sanskrit word actually means giving up, renouncing. Just think, if you're sitting, many, many Western Buddhists talk about a sitting practice. Not sitting thinking, not sitting sleeping, not sitting dreaming. Just sitting. Be here. Now. Don't be dreaming about the future or the past. And the only way to do that is to give up. Give up thinking. Give up listening. Give up looking. Give up hearing and so on. And if you give everything up, like taking the onion and peeling away layer by layer by layer, when it's all gone, what do you find? Different schools of Buddhism have different answers to that, of course, but basically the answer is mind. Not your mind or my mind, mind, which is all there is. Or you could say love if you want. That would be a more Christian way of looking at it. But what it is that fills the spaces between stars or between atoms is what we are. And if we stop pretending that we have separate identities, we stop pretending that us and the world are different things, that there's an in here and out there. If we stop pretending that, which we do by sitting practice, then the world becomes very different. And if you look at a deeper level of metaphor, the light that strikes from the west onto the moss is just so ordinary. Happens every day. Millions of years it's been happening. And yet, each time it's different. If you take it as a metaphor for the awakening to the truth, the illumination, the enlightenment at the heart of Buddhism, remember the word Buddha comes from the Sanskrit root bud, which means light. To be out of the darkness of ignorance into the light of truth. The light comes round and shines. And as Weinberger says, as a metaphor for illumination, the ordinary sunset represents the extraordinary enlightenment of an individual. But that extraordinary enlightenment in the context of the entire universe is as ordinary as sunlight shining on moss. It's a beautifully circular, it's like one of Escher's paintings, you know, it's a circular argument here that this moment, like every moment in our lives, is unique and priceless, but also every day and ordinary. 
So as we dive into this poem, it becomes like clear water. Einstein, not the scientist, the other Einstein who wrote about Mozart, he describes some of Mozart's music as being like pure water. It's so clear that at first sight it seems shallow, but the longer you look, the deeper it gets. He was talking about some piano sonatas which have been described as too difficult for, sorry, too easy for beginners and too difficult for professionals. And I think that's a very good description of this poem. For the, for the undergraduate, or the, the primary school student, the language is so simple and easy that it's very simple. You think you understand it. But I think the longer you look at it, the more difficult and complex it gets, the more um, redolent, resonant the metaphors are, the more you see how beautifully, elegantly it's put together. As, um, you know, the, the, as, as Weinberger points out, the, the, the western setting sun, the light of the sunlight, for Wang Wei, as a, as a devotee of pure land Buddhism, meant one thing and one thing only. That meant Amitofo, the Buddha Amitabha, and his pure land. And it meant waking up to that. So this is religious poetry. And he says it's perfectly objective, impersonal, far from the, the poetry of San Juan de la Cruz, but just as authentic, just as profound as San Juan de la Cruz. Now, at the first reading, this is not immediately apparent. But if you're with me so far, would you agree there is more to this poem than we first thought? Yes? Are you beginning to see there's a poem behind this? Huh? You know, and it, it is, it's the clarity of this poem is the blinding thing. It looks simple. And it is um, an endless series of negations from the very beginning. Kong, not real, empty. Bu right. not see, another negation. Right. Uh, so the, but the mountain isn't empty because there are people. We don't see them, but we hear them. So it's not this, not that, it's not this. Negation upon negation upon negation. Now this is a term, this is... It exists in um, medieval Christian thinking, scholasticism as well, you know, definition by negation. It's not this, it's not that, but of course it also goes back to Hinduism, the precursor of Buddhism, you may say, where um, uh, the not this, not that. Truth is neither this nor that. If you say this, it implies that, which is dual. There's no duality, that's the illusion. It's all one thing. So this statement, the negation, the mountain is empty because it's an illusion, because everything we perceive is an illusion. And then there's also this other negation that from the Western paradise, the light, which is also shadow, is falling into the forest. You see this? Distrust of language. How do you translate a poem which has at its heart a profound mistrust of language? If I knew the answer to that, I would be much more famous. Well, no, I wouldn't. If I knew the answer to that, I'd probably be sitting on a mountain in China, you know, in a, in a monastery somewhere. Uh, but as I'm not, um, so what, what time are we booked to finish? I didn't ask Ten before. I went. More. Ten minutes more. Half past five. Oh, fine. Okay, I haven't overrun. No, no, fine. Because I'm nearly, I'm nearly there. I have known this poem for forty years, and I have tried on and off to, to translate it. But as I say, it's one of these. It, it's, it runs through your fingers. When you pick it up, there's nothing there. But one of the clues I found is let's go back to this title, Lu Jai, Deer Park. It's a place name, ladies and gentlemen. It's a place name. And where is that place? Well, Wang Wei gave uh, that name to one part of his estate, which was at Lantien near uh, uh, Xi'an in Shanxi. But that name is actually originally uh, a place near Sarnath in northern India. After the Buddha's first enlightenment, 
he and his disciples were given some place to live in a place whose name translates as Deer Park. So Wang Wei Yu and his contemporary readers would immediately know from the title alone, without looking at the poem, without even coming to that first word, that kong, they would know that this is a Buddhist poem. And therefore, metaphors about illumination and so on are to be expected. Did you know it was a, a place name? An Indian name? Okay. Well, so my attempt to translate this um, comes next. This is the Sanskrit. Mrigadava is the Sanskrit. That is the original name, as far as we know, uh, for that place near Sarnath where the Buddha stayed. Is that a good translation of Lujai? What's the correct answer to that question? It depends. <laughs> one of the things it depends on is who is your reader. You know, In the translation process, there is only one person who matters more than anybody else, and that's the reader. It depends who you're translating for. The, our first original word-by-word, -word, when I was struggling with classical Chinese, trying to learn this impossible language, that was what I wanted. I didn't want fancy poetic translations. I wanted to know, what does this word mean? What does this word mean? I wanted empty mountain, not sea person. Perfect translation for me, because that's what I, I was using it for something else. What is, who is your reader? Well, I don't know who the reader for. If, perhaps, I suppose, if I was translating for an Indian publication, then Rigadava would be a good thing. But then if I was translating for India, I wouldn't be translating it into Scots. This, ladies and gents, is my other language which is related to English in the same way that Catalan is related to French or Spanish. English and Scots descend from the same ancestor. I haven't, this isn't finished, I haven't got the rhythm and the sounds right yet. It's a work in progress. I've only been work playing with it for about 10 years, so you know, there's time still. As an aside, before I read it to you, I will tell you something that if you think you want to be a translator of poetry, then there is only one essential tool that you need. You must have a rich husband, because you will never make money, ever. I'm sad to say, I, I stand before you. Actually, I'll be coming around with my hat later, see if you have any spare change, you know. I, I was at a, a literary festival in Ireland two weeks ago, and I was saying to people, yeah, I've translated 15 books of poetry. Can you spare a few euros for a cup of tea? You know? We don't do it for riches or honor, or glory. We do it because it's impossible. But we do it. Theoretically, philosophically, it's impossible, but we do it. And we do it because the music that I make is never going to be Wang Wei's music. And the understanding of the world and the universe and philosophy and Buddhism of the reader of my poem is not going to be the same as Wang Wei's. Even if you're Chinese, Wang Wei was more than a thousand years ago. He's as far away from you as I am from China. Translation across time is just as difficult. Uh, it's more difficult because it's about translation across cultures too. The culture of the Tang Dynasty is not modern China. So there's a huge gap. The best we can do is make a poem that brings a tear to the reader's eye, moves the reader, perhaps not in ways that Wang Wei meant, but in ways that maybe make, them, make the reader stop for a moment and go, oh, I wonder. Mm. I don't expect this. I present this to you just as a piece of um, entertainment. I, mean, I could not come to Barcelona and not give you something in Scots. Our relationship with our language, in Scotland we have a great deal of respect and envy for Catalonia. Our language has no official status in Scotland, still. Although we have our own, we've had our own parliament back since 97. The Scots language is recognized by Europe but not by Westminster, and only partly in Scotland. It is taught in schools now, but when I was growing up, it was not. I went to what was, I'm told, was probably the only school in Scotland where we read, apart from Robert Burns, we read the great medieval poets and we read the great contemporary 20th century Scots poets. We read Scot novels written in Scots. We read the literature of our language. Mostly, it was talked in the playground and it was the despised and rejected. Like Kafka said in his day, 
that uh, Czech was the language of cheap comedians and peasants. So our language was seen. Now, it's not so long ago that Catalan was looked down on by officialdom. So, you know, you, you remember this. So I, I come to you knowing something of being bicultural, of standing with your feet in two camps, tricultural if you had the Chinese, but also just to present you with a little present, a little gift from Scotland. This is how Wang Wei sounds. And I'm quite proud of the fact that I got a, a, there is a rhyme in it. Rhymes are always a surprise to me. They happen by accident. So, Mrigadava, Tim Hills, and ne'er a body to be seen. Dist the soon the herkent voices yonder. Sklent and licht, streaks into the deep woods, and leams again on the fog say green. See? Seen green. Fog, incidentally, is, it always causes confusion in, in, with English speakers. Fog in Scots is moss in English. Moss in Scots means a bog or a swamp or marshy ground, which confuses the hell out of the English, but not our problem. But there you see that's a different sound. It's a funkier sound than the Chinese. You know, the, the music of Scots gives you a, a, it's more robust than the music of the Chinese. And maybe that supplies the, the, la the lack of this pitch contour thing. So, Tim Hills and near a body to be seen. Dis the soon the harkent voices yonder. Sklent and lich streaks into deep woods and leams again on the fogs of green. See you soon, Walter's gracias. Thank you for staying awake, and let me reassure you that some of what I said was true. Thank you very much. Well, uh, any question? Thank you very much for, for your lecture. Very interesting how the last day, mm. uh, different versions, and how, how is uh, behind no, the, the, mm -hmm. this work, no, translate poetry. No? Uh, well, any question? Now you have the chance to ask one specialist, one expert. In well, I, I promise some of my answers will be true. <laughs> there are no silly questions. I might give you a silly answer, but you know, <laughs> don't be shy. I, was, I, was, I wanted to ask you, well, I wanted to ask you about the about, uh, about, uh, green. Mm -hmm. Because um, a lot of translators, like yourself, have translated as green. Mm -hmm. And I understood that this term had, well, not just in, in nowadays, mm -hmm. but it has, it's very loaded as well, in terms of, well, also in the, in the uh, Hui, in the Chinese Muslim uh, cult, but in all, just without going there, this green, bright, Mm -hmm. this color, mm -hmm. and I was wondering if you can comment about why all of you are going for the green. Well, I can't, anterior is the previous slide, isn't it? Hmm? It says anterior here, so I would try that one and see what happens. That's the one. Well, I can't talk, I can't talk, I mean, I can't channel Burton Watson or Kenneth Rex or Sir Snyder. I don't know why they chose it, but I'll tell you why I chose it. Look at the first line, scene, green. I chose it for the rhyme. <laughs> for those of you who don't know about this, this, this Chinese word qing is a color word which is extraordinarily flexible. It can be the color of a stormy sky, it can be the color of storm clouds, it can be the color of stones, it can be, you know, so it, there is no English word that is equivalent. So, I mean, I could have called it, but then, you know, if you think what, well, Thai, of course, it could be lichen, which could be orange or yellow or, you know, it's a, it's a wonderful color word. It's a very interesting question, but I'm, ve I'm a very simple man. I, ch I chose green because I had seen. <laughs> Some, sometimes it's simpler than you think. <laughs> Next. Question. Uh, 
Well, I, I, I would like, uh, because you are, you are here, if you could intro, introduce us your last uh, work in collaboration, the oh. Jade Ladder. I, I, I okay. think that now is the moment. Uh, now we, is the moment, yes. We would like to know about this Sadly, work. Sadly, these are just advanced, I only have a few advanced copies from the printer. So you, have to, you can buy it on Amazon. Amazon, or any good bookshop, right? That's the commercial part of the afternoon finished. Right? This book started as a collaboration. It, it's, there are four editors. The first, um, W. N. Herbert, is a Scottish poet, a professor of poetry in Newcastle University, and he was in China at the invitation of Yang Lien, who's a Beijing poet. Yang and I have been working together this year. For, this year now makes 20 years. 15 book, uh, no, 14 books together. Um, I, don't, I know of no other Chinese uh, poet who has worked with the same translator over the same period of time. Yang and I are like an old married couple now. You know. he, he doesn't like it, but I mean, I say to him, I'm pretty sure I could write a Yang Lian poem. I know he's worked so well. You know. He goes, no, you couldn't, no, you couldn't. Anyway. Bill Herbert had this idea, but he was talking, he was on a tour talking to Chinese poets and he was looking at the translations of the work and he felt as though there was something missing. The expression he used was, you know, if you eat a sweet with the paper still on it, yeah, you, know, you know there's a sweet in there but you can't quite taste it. As a poet he was looking at translations and he said there must be more here than I see. So he had the idea of making an anthology. So Yang Lian got together with the, the young poet and critic Qin Xiaoyu, also from I think he's Beijing or Tianjin. Qin Xiaoyu is one of these guys who is the, has written books of criticism of contemporary poetry that just turn the subject upside down. He's completely outside of the writer's union official thing. And he's a very perceptive and exciting critic. So Bill said to these guys, why you choose the poems? Every other anthology of Chinese poetry and translation has been chosen either by a Chinese university professor who is not a poet or by a Western university professor who is not a poet. Nobody had ever gone to the Chinese poets and said, what do you think are the best poems? And they decided not the poems that were politically interesting, not the poems that had great social effect 20 years ago, but poems of high literary quality. That meant Neither Yang nor Qin Xiaoyu are translators. Bill Herbert himself has collaborated with poets in other languages, but he's not a translator either. But the two guys picking the poems didn't have a single thought of whether these poems were easy or difficult to translate, whether they could be translated even. So the next stage was I, was, I came into it with my assistant, Lee Man Ke in Hong Kong, and we did the first literals. And then we sent them to Yang Lian to get to mistakes and to help, just a, a second view. And then the other thing that is really important about this book, not only the, book, the poems were chosen by Chinese people, but at the end of the process, W. N. Herbert and I sat down with my drafts. Now, I and uh, Lee Man Kei, we did about 70% of the book. The rest was bought in by work by other, other translators, and Bill Herbert chose the one, only the ones that worked as poems in English. He was very, very thorough, very critical. But he and I sat down and went through my drafts, and he showed me, or together we worked in how to, how to we worked on making them work as poems, not as translations. We wanted English poems. And nobody reads like a translator. Nobody reads as closely as a translator, except a poet who doesn't speak the source language. He would look through a poem, and, and then he'd look at it and say, nah, too many Fs. Now, as when you're translating, you don't, often, you don't think about that. You don't think about the too, too many D sounds or too many F sounds. But the poet immediately sees it. This isn't working because you need to vary the sounds. And that was a fascinating experience for me. It was like I used the, you know, I, I used the image earlier on of, you know, of my drafts. It's like a very rough uh, diamond. But Bill Herbert just turned the diamond so the light shone through it in a different way. And a new poem emerged. It was a fascinating experience. And it is my contention, 
that this, point, this only includes work from the last 30 years. It only includes work from um, the People's Republic of China, so, or poets who came from there. It includes poets who don't live there currently, like Bei Dao and Yang Lian and so on. It does not include poets from Taiwan or Hong Kong. It does not include Chinese poets whose first language is not Chinese. So Mongolian poetry, Uyghur, Tibetan poetry, we didn't have the language skills for that. If this book sells well enough, that might be the next one. Another book that could come out of this is, um, I think women poets are underrepresented in here. You know, there could be a whole book of women poetry. And I think when, the, as I say, these are advanced copies I have. When it comes to be reviewed, I think one thing reviewers will pick up on is, is that there are more men than women in the book. So there's another book, volume two. The women, because women's poetry in China in the last, or poetry written by women in China in the last 30 years is extraordinarily interesting, very rich, and a very new tradition. And they are breaking the rules. The guys like, you know, the Monglung, Monglung Pai, the, the, the young guys who were breaking the rules in the 70s, Man Ke, Yang Lian, Duo Duo, Bei Dao, and so on, were defining a kind of poetry. And, and very often younger women poets like um, Jai Yong Ming, who's just won an Italian prize, uh, she rewrote the rules. And she's in the book, but you know, there should be many more like her that we didn't have space for. So it's a work in progress. This is just the beginning. But four years of my life, and I may also say that for a research project for which we in the end didn't get the money, Bill Herbert and I sat down in front of my computer looking at the drafts, trying to polish them into poems, and we recorded ourselves. And listening back to it, I'm astonished by how much swearing there is. There's some extremely bad language as we went through the process, but also by how funny they are. So I don't know, maybe these will come out as a, on internet radio or something, you might, uh, which would be a whole completely new insight into the making of a book. How often do you get to hear the translator talk about word choice? Why green? Why this? Why that? I had to, you know, I, I had to justify it. He would ask me, why did you hear that word? So I'd have to go to the dictionary and show him and then. So we're hoping to do something with that material. One thing again we want, another thing that's absent, this is um, English only. It's not a bilingual text. It would have been far too big. But then if you have a bilingual text, if you're an English speaker and you have a bilingual text of Spanish poetry, Spanish and English, even if you don't speak Spanish, you can see something of the music. But as you see with the Chinese, you can no sense of the music of it. So what we wanted to do is make a DVD to go with the book of the poets reading, well, the ones who are still alive, you know, of poets reading their works. So the music of the Chinese is available. But Again, that's something we didn't get money for, so it's not finished. This is, the, this is stage one. And I'm not going to do any more advertisements. I think it's a very interesting book. And, uh, well, you'll enjoy it. Thank you for giving me the chance to sell the book. <laughs> I'm done. <laughs> I'm finished. Thank you. Thank, thank you for staying awake. I don't know if you have any question about the, this anthology. Just that uh, to sell a book without the book, it's, it, it fits the topic of the talk of the void. <laughs> this, yes, and it's a tra I'm, I'm selling the void. <laughs> Very good. <laughs> okay. Okay, thank you. Thank you.